Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm Leon Blevins, Professor of Government at El Paso Community College. I believe it was in 1989, I was walking down the hallway on the way to one of my classes where I was going to be discussing defense policy, U.S. defense policy. And I was dressed in gray, or a greenish kind of looking fatigues. And I was going as Rambo. I had a headband on and I was going to class as Rambo. A young man in a wheelchair saw me and he said, who are you? What do you teach? And I told him. So the next semester I saw him, he was registered and he showed up in my class in his wheelchair. And he told me that he had been in the Army and that he'd served, I believe he said, the 82nd Airborne. And he had been sent to the Middle East on a UN mission. Reagan was president. And then he was sent with his group to Grenada. And when he was parachuting into Grenada to help save some of the American citizens that were studying there and found themselves under a dictator, his parachute tangled up and he landed on the ground and he was broken apart. Ended up being a paraplegic that put him in that wheelchair. So we had several moments over the time of that semester where we talked about some of that. So he asked me, when were you going to do Rambo in my class? So I told him on what day I would show up. I showed up on that day and here he comes in his wheelchair with a plastic bag from Walmart. And in that bag, he had this beret, an orange beret. He said, Mr. Blevins, I thought about giving you for your class my green beret, but I worked so hard to get that, I can't do that. But he said, I'm gonna give you my orange beret from the United Nations mission in the Middle East, and this is for you to show your classes. And I began to cry as he handed me that, and I handed off my camera and a picture was taken of Rene giving me this brown beret, or this kind of orange beret. And tears were running down my cheeks, running down his cheek, and it was a very emotional experience because he fought in the service and was paralyzed for the rest of his life. Several years ago, and I'll close this pretty quickly, I was doing Grandparents Day as a dance performer at Silla Vista Mall. I come off the stage and there sits Rene Aguanaga, this man who had been in my class years before. This was about 2007 now. And I walked over and said, Rene, it's good to see you. What are you doing? What have you been doing all these years? He said he finished his degree in biology at UTEP. He got some grant money and so on. Then he went to work for the Department of Agriculture. They sent him to Puerto Rico to deal with pests that were infesting hardwood forest. Then they sent him to El Paso and put him in charge eventually of the pest control and plants coming across from Mexico here on our border area. He said one day President Bush showed up and asked to meet him personally and talk to some of these people involved in sensitive areas on our border. I said, Rene, when you fell out of the sky, did you think your life was over? He said, yes. A very smart man though, and perseverance. And here he became so good at what he was doing, he became director of an area and met the President of the United States. That's a wonderful story, a story of a wounded warrior who yeah. made the most out of what he had, even from a wheelchair. My guests today are Bob Chisholm, retired lieutenant colonel who served in three wars for the United States of America. He served in World War II in Europe, he served in Korea, and he served in Vietnam. Bob, it's a great honor to have you here today. Thank you. And then we have Mr. Bremensdorf. You may want to say it correctly for me. How do you pronounce your last name? Just Bema Steffer. Bema Steffer. Yeah. Bema Steffer. Unless you, you want to be my diaper. And you go, yeah, you go by Beamy. That's how your uh, friends Beamy is what that nickname me. Okay, so Beamy served in World War II and served in Europe in some of the most dangerous battles that you can imagine, Normandy and others, and was injured so much that he ended up having to retire from the military service. But he's been honored many, many times in many different ways. Mr. Chisholm, Bob has been honored, and Beamy has been honored, and others, John Ceballos and others here, with the 82nd Airborne Division. Let's start with you. Uh, Bob, tell us about your service and getting into Airborne. Why did you want to be at jumping out of airplanes with parachutes? Well, I enlisted in August of uh, 1942, was sent to uh, Camp Walters, Texas, for my basic training, and uh, during the basic training they sent out uh, a group from Fort Benning, Georgia, paratroopers, mm -hmm. and they put on a demonstration for us. And I was so impressed by 
these uh, paratroopers and uh, what they looked like they were capable of doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, being uh, uh, young and a little bit dumb, I thought, well, <laughs> that is for me. And that day I volunteered for the Airborne. Wow. Subsequently went to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, to the parachute school. And uh, one thing that I'll always remember is the instructor says, look to your right, look to your left. That person won't be here when you finish this course. Yeah. And I thought, my goodness, they're talking about me. Mm -hmm. But I made it. Good for yeah, you. And you survived. Tough. Can you imagine? Tough. You survived, survived three wars. Yes. Somebody was Thank watching God. over you. <laughs> okay, Beamy, tell us about it. How did you get into this? How did well, you get into Well, uh, when I was a kid, 1939, my parents taken me to New York World's Fair, and there they had a jump tar. Mm -hmm. you, I think it cost a quarter to ride the thing. I rode it two times and I never forgot it. When the, the war broke out, I think it was back in the, either May or March, I knew that I was going to be drafted in April, so I volunteered in the paratroops. Wow. And by uh, May, I was already sent down to Fort Benning, Georgia. And I trained down there in early 42. And I stayed there for about three months as a, a dummy jump sergeant. Just that's what they pinned the sort of stripes on you. Yeah. Just to act to get to, until others came through. Then I was transferred back to Benning and uh, Benning sent me up to Bragg where the 101st was already training. And that's where I joined the 501 Parachute Infantry. Wow. You probably get asked this question a lot in different interviews. You were just recently interviewed uh, for the El Paso Times, an article about uh, uh, some of your activities in Germany. What was your most frightening experience in being a paratrooper? When you really th thought you weren't going to make it, but you still made it. Uh, I believe that my most frightening experience was uh, uh, during the Normandy operation. Mm -hmm. I was on a patrol behind the German lines and uh, I was wounded for the first time. And uh, it happened to uh, be on my 19th birthday. Oh my word. Oh goodness, you survived. Beamy, what was your most frightening experience as a parent? Well, I had some bad ones during Normandy because I was a pathfinder. Okay. and went in a few hours ahead of the main group. Wow. It was kind of scary because I landed in water and we had to set up special equipment for the men that were coming in later. Because if those men didn't come in, we weren't strong enough to handle. We would have been under, we were in bad trouble. Mm -hmm. But I think my worst experience I ever had was on a patrol in Holland, looking for some pallets that were down and I got walked into what was supposed to be some kind of a German machine gun nest and I got banging at it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were held captured for about a week or two, but for some, I can't go into that no, no, you special thing, we got back to our lines again. And uh, I think that was my scariest thing because I never thought I'd get back. Wow, you're back, you're here. Uh, you brought some pictures with you, pictures of you, pictures of some of the maps. You spent a lot of time looking at maps. You know, uh, I gave your, your museum out on Fort Boulevard, the Airborne Museum, a map from Vietnam. Yes. Now, Beamy, you brought a booklet and showed some of the maps. So you spent quite a bit of time looking at those maps, planning and preparing before you went into Holland, before you went into Normandy. It was always sand tables after sand tables. And after a while, you memorized the place. You didn't even have to look at the maps anymore. Mm -hmm. And it was just uh, kept pumped into you day after day. It'd get you up at sometimes two o'clock in the morning and back on the tables or, or take you out the night jump. So you were supposed to act on instinct by the time you got there. Yeah, well, that's the way it was because once you got put inside that wire fence to be a wire, a parafinder, you couldn't talk to nobody else on the outside. Mm -hmm. It was so special. Bob, what about leadership? I know that Eisenhower was supreme commander, and, and the men and women involved in all of that respected him so much. Isn't there a lot to that, the respect of the leadership, whether you're a lieutenant colonel or you're a general or you're a first sergeant or whatever, that you're looking to people that you can trust? 
leadership. Well, as I told you, that picture I showed you where Eisenhower was sent us off, he gave us a speech and says, you 350 are going in to set up. If the main group cannot make it, you're on your own. And Bob can verify that mm -hmm. because he was set up as a pathfinder also. And this is what became known as D-Day, yes. invasion of Normandy. I had a former colleague at UTEP many years ago, a, a Dr. Beasley, who was one of those that went in on the beach at, at Normandy on D-Day. A lot of these people that I've known in some of these don't like to talk about them very much because it was so horrible what they saw, their buddies being killed and everything. Uh, Bob, uh, talk to us a little bit about preparations and the planning that you went through in what was the program that was in the newspaper just the other day? Tell us about that one, that invasion that you were involved in. Burning bridges and things of that nature? Uh, or, uh, Operation Market Garden, Market are you Garden? speaking of? Well, of course, Operation Market Garden was the, uh, the uh, airborne operation into Holland mm -hmm. in conjunction with uh, the British 30th Corps. And uh, we uh, dropped the 101st in the vicinity of Eidenhoven, the 82nd uh, in the vicinity of Nijmegen, and the British uh, in the vicinity of Arnhem with the Polish Brigade. Okay. And uh, the, the, the goal of the operation was to seize the bridges over those rivers to facilitate uh, the drive into Germany, mm -hmm. and uh, was really the uh, plan of uh, General Montgomery, who was in command of the British troops. And uh, had it been successful, it would probably have uh, ended the war by six or seven months. Mm -hmm. But as history will uh, recount, uh, it wasn't a successful operation. We failed to, the British failed to take the bridge at, uh, at Arnhem, and uh, consequently the uh, operation failed. Well, in a war, you'd like to win all of them. You'd like for all of them to be successful, but even if one is bad, you learn from that and know how to handle some upcoming things that you're going to be involved in, right? That is correct. And of course, uh, there. Uh, uh, lesson, really a lesson learned was uh, pay attention to your intelligence. Uh -huh. And uh, that's what uh, the, the uh, leaders failed to do because they had intelligence that uh, two armored divisions were being refitted in German uh, panzer divisions were being refitted in the vicinity of Arnhem. Uh -huh. And uh, very good intelligence from the Dutch underground and General Montgomery uh, didn't uh, pay attention to it. I want to ask you a very sensitive question. <clears throat> when the Vietnam Memorial Wall replica was in El Paso, about the year 2000, somewhere along in there, and my wife Shannon and I went out there, I was there as Uncle Sam, a veteran from Vietnam called us over and he said, I want to show you something. He counted off 11 names on that wall that were all his buddies killed in a battle in Vietnam that he survived. And he was still dealing with survival guilt. You ever have that? How did you deal with survival guilt that you survived this? You lived through three wars and some of your friends did not. Well, I think you, uh, uh, I think you have to be mentally prepared for uh, a, a combat and uh, being a survivor of combat. Uh, you're, going to be, uh, uh, you're going to be bothered by the fact that uh, you survived and uh, uh, one of your best friends or several of your best friends didn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something that uh, you have to deal with. It's not something you're going to ever get over. Uh, the thoughts are always going to be there. Right. And uh, something will happen that will uh, uh, recall uh, the uh, memory of uh, the time that you lost your friends. Right. But uh, it's... It's, uh, it's a mental thing then. It's it, a it, mental it, thing. It is, yeah. it is a mental thing. Yeah. What about and, that, Beamy? Well... What helped me, I was a farm boy. We lived in a cold country, Hershey, Harrisburg, and then places very in Pennsylvania. cold. And, and also, I was a Scot, a Boy Scot, and trained real hard as a Boy Scot. I never made Eagle, okay. but I got up very close to it. And uh, I think living out in the grounds and, and learning different things that the Scots treated me, and also being a a farm boy, mm -hmm. I think helped me a lot because I was a lot of our boys that were in there, they were good paratroopers, but came from the city 
and never knew how it was to lay out in the snow and ice at maybe hour after hour like we did years ago. And uh, toughens you up. And then when you got into the bulge where we had this terrible snowstorm and it was bad, very bad because we didn't have proper clothes like the Germans had. And uh, the weather was unbelievable. Just, well, I can't explain how bad no. the weather was. Plus, we didn't have the food. We didn't have the right guns and stuff. And you might have heard the story that we gathered some of the guns of the young troopers that were set up there when the Germans broke through that were retreating. And we did, were low in supplies, and we took anything that they had oh, wow. that they dropped along the road. And Bob can also verify that because I'm sure in the group that he went in did the same. The 101st was thrown right in the center, and we had many a good help from the troopers on both sides. Let's talk about the idea. A, a movie was made about this. Band of Brothers, camaraderie, looking to the right, looking to the left, and whatever. And on either side, you're thinking about how am I going to work with them and protect them and protect myself and survive through this horrible experience. What about that being a band of brothers? You know, I think uh, uh, Beamy can better answer that question because he was in the 501st Parachute Infantry, and that was the same division that the Band of Brothers was organized in. Oh, yeah. tell us then, Beamy, about yeah, the Band of Brothers. Words, as I was told you before, he was my my friend from Hershey. And who is he? He went to the same college that I was going to, Franklin Marshall. Okay. That's in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Okay. But he was ahead of me, and he also moved up in rank. He was uh, down in there. He was only a second lieutenant when we were training, and he automatically moved up. But he was a very good, honest man, good to be with. And his, oh, anyone you talk to in the 506 thought the world of him. Now give so, us his name again. Uh, uh, Major Winters. Major Winters. Yes. He's the one that had most of the writing and stories that helped to make up the Band of Brothers movie. Wow. We went to the first movie that was showed in Don, the four of us, and asked us questions what we thought of it. And uh, we gave them different answers. <laughs> and it was pretty darn true. <clears throat> Just like Bob can tell you about uh, the bridge too far, uh, much better than I can tell you on that because he was closer to the bridge. I had some places that I was at at the bridges, but not the main, main bridge where they were at. Mm -hmm. So that's how I know how they stuck together. And uh, during our training, they gave us some terrible beatings. Uh, got us up at any time of the night uh, sometimes one dirty thing they did to us one time. They called us in in the mess hall, gave us a lot of spaghetti and stuff like that. And after we were filled, within an hour later, they put us in a run. Oh, and it's, no. if you know what's gonna that happen, you, you gonna throw eat up. a lot. <laughs> and that's the kind of dirty tricks they would pull on us just to see if how tough we could be. Mm. And it, to, to make the troopers sometimes it was pretty rough, well, and if you did you were sent to the gliders. Evidently, they toughened you up both in Europe yes, and sure the did. Pacific to defeat the Germans and the Japanese in that world war. It was truly a world war. Before our time is gone, let's talk about Band of Brothers after the war is over. You well, were, you were sidelined because of what happened to you physically. <laughs> You've kept up with some of your band of brothers, haven't you, over all these years? Yes, a couple times we were at uh, different reunions, like one time in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And that's about the last time that I got in with the 101st because I later on came and joined with the 82nd as uh, Benavides. And I got to be among the friends there better than the others with that always were traveling up New England or Chicago or mm -hmm. places that was just too far away for me to go. Right. And I, I, I just took a liking to the 82nd. And this is much nicer weather down here than up Good in Pennsylvania. The weather's here. <laughs> and my conditions from back east, I had to, I had to give up my work mm -hmm. and was, had to take a, a medical discharge. Well, Bob, tell us about that. I know I've been out to your museum several times and and pose for pictures, Veterans Day Parade with a number of your people and the floats and so on. 
What about that? You have a band of brothers right here. We do have. The, uh, uh, the bond between the airborne and the paratroopers is so very strong that uh, it uh, will always exist. Uh, I think uh, a good example of that is the fact that uh, Angel Romero, who passed away not too long ago, right. and I were in the same battalion in the 508 during World War II. And uh, we, were, uh, we were very, very close during times of combat. And then, of course, after the war, we went our separate ways. And then I came to El Paso, and who did I run into again but Angel Romero? And that was a relationship of some 60-something years. And uh, when you say, uh, you speak of uh, relatives and uh, your brothers, but uh, this is a relationship that uh, is not a blood relationship, but it is stronger than any blood relationship that you would ever have. Well, certainly, because you he involved was truly, in He was truly my brother. You were involved in life and death experiences. Absolutely, and, uh, and uh, this comradeship just uh, will uh, be always so very strong. And that, that, uh, you see that every day at the Benavides Patterson All Airborne Chapter. Right, right, right. There's just a, just a relationship there that you won't see any place else. Yeah, and there's several veterans groups that I've worked with here in El Paso, and some don't seem as close as others. That's true. And there are, you, you can see it in what's happening in the, in the rooms and so on. And I'm not putting any groups down. I've done for so many different groups. But it seems like your group really is very, very close. They are very close. Yeah, very close. Um, I hope I, I'm, I brought today for Marco to weave in a picture of Joseph uh, Hernandez and a few others and a little bit of your museum. I, I don't have a whole lot, but some from some of those experiences. And so it gives us a chance to talk about old times. You have a lot of Army stories, right? A lot of paratrooper stories. Well, if we're, um, we're open every Tuesday and Thursday. We call this our work day, but really it's a coffee call. And uh, the people come in, they'll sit down, and they'll have a cup of coffee. I often uh, say that I wished I had a uh, recording device so I could record the stories because you hear some just outstanding <laughs> stories that you would right. never ever hear again or hear before. Because right. we've got Green Beret, we've got Rangers, and of course we've got the Airborne. You had to be Airborne before you could be a Green Beret or Rangers. Mm -hmm. So that's a basic step of, uh, of becoming a member of this group, is being Airborne. And uh, you just hear some fantastic stories. Right. Uh, you're welcome to come in and join us anytime. Yeah, We'd love yeah. to have you. I want you to give a telephone number, a contact number for people that want to know more about it, or maybe there's some uh, fairly new people that have been paratroopers that you'd like to get them involved. Well, our, uh, uh, our, our phone number at the chapter is 915-562-9969. And, and they, our public information officer at our chapter is John Ceballos. Right. And uh, I'll tell you, nobody is a better public relations officer than John Ceballos. <laughs> he works at it 24 hours a day. He made an extra trip over here the other day just to scout it out and the route to get you here. <laughs> yes. That's the kind of person he is. Yes, he does those things. Oh, that's wonderful. We have about five minutes left. Any, it, well, I want to tell you one you, thing what about what? Uh, during the 50th anniversary, the government set up a special thing that we would go to England for a week, to, to Belgium, to Holland wow. and to the, the four places uh -huh. and stay with families uh -huh. and the families would take us around. And to this day, I get letters from the different schools over there because I spoke in Normandy uh -huh. and also a Catholic school in, in uh, Belgium. And to this day, I get letters and every time, uh, this is so funny, wow. uh, they want information, they sent me a $2 bill always American $2 bill <laughs> in order that I send stuff back to them. Oh, my goodness. And it's, it's the strangest thing. And also in our, uh, our building, we have classes for different children, and we have a little party for them. They sit down and ask us different questions of, of here and there and what's going on. And it's, it's so nice to sit with 30, 40 children and try to answer some of their questions that almost are impossible Well, you answer. help save their society. You help save their society for them. That's the reason some call this the greatest generation. Yes. The World War II generation. It wasn't just fighting about one dictator in one country. This was about world domination 
yes. by people like the Japanese and the German governments of that time. But just as I told you today, one lady I asked if you ever know where Market Garden, she says, is that something down in El Paso? I said, <laughs> garden. Market Garden is a big operation that happened in Holland where there were 60,000 or better and there was uh, 39,400 paratroopers that jumped between American, British, Polish, and 101st and 82nd. No, this is unknown history to many in our generation. Uh, Bob, we have just about two minutes left. Any last words about your organization, the, the museum, or anything you'd like to get before the public before we close out? Well, we're working on getting a grant so we can uh, uh, enlarge our chapter home mm -hmm. on uh, Port Boulevard. Okay. Uh, we, uh, uh, we're sponsoring, uh, on the uh, 17th of December, we're sponsoring a conference on the Battle of the Bulge. And that will, the, we've had Normandy, we've had Operation Market Garden. Now it'll be the Battle of the Bulge in December. Okay. And uh, we're inviting any World War II veterans or any participant that uh, served during the Battle of the Bulge to take part in this uh, commemoration. Okay, you want to give the address on Fort Boulevard? 2608 Fort Boulevard. 2608. Right off, right off of Alabama. Right. We have a nice building there. It's easily identifiable by the big sign that says Partita Hall, which is the name of our chapter home. Okay. Well, we're going to try to weave in some pictures of some of your facilities there and some of the people that were there. You give my regards to all of those that are out there with your Thank you so much. Thanks for being here, Beamy and Bob. And that's another program. Hope you found it interesting today, talking about history of World War II and especially in Europe. Thanks for being with us. I'm Leon Levins.